Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome to Windsor Dermatology's Healthy Skin Highlights. Tonight is our eighth lecture of a 14 lecture series. Throughout the lecture series, the providers at Windsor Dermatology will discuss multiple different common dermatological conditions. Tonight, our topic is, now forgive me, hydrantinitis supertiva, presented by Alexa Hetzel. Alexa is a physician assistant at the office and practices general, surgical, and cosmetic dermatology. Alexa graduated from Monmouth University and was inducted into the uh, Phi Alpha Pi National Honor Society celebrating academic excellence. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the text box below and we will uh, address them at the end of the discussion. We at Windsor Dermatology are thrilled you took the time to join us for this exciting episode of Healthy Skin Highlights, an educational web series with Windsor Dermatology hosted by Alexa Hetzel, talking all things, again, forgive me, hydrodenitis supertiva. And here is Alexa Hetzel. Thank you, Alicia. Hi, everybody. Let me just get my screen shared. And we will be good to roll. All right. So we are talking about hydradenitis supertiva, also known or abbreviated as HS. I'll primarily use that as we go through. So just wanted to make sure I disclaim that. So before we go into what hydradenitis is, let's discuss very briefly the skin. Because the skin plays a huge factor in why this disease occurs and how it really can be affected. So we have three main layers of skin very um, broadly in a term. We have the epidermis, which is this top layer of the skin. We have the dermis, which is the second layer of the skin. And then we have the sub subcutaneous layer. So as we go through, try just to um, hold on to this image for the next few slides, which is gonna give us a lot more information and probably hopefully help you understand this condition a little bit better. So the epidermis. The epidermis is what we see. It's the top layer of your skin, and it's in charge of a few things. It's in charge of making new skin cells, and this happens at the very bottom layer of the epidermis, and then the skin cells travel up, almost like how hot air rises. The skin matures and grows to the top layer and then eventually flakes off. Um, this takes about a month for the whole thing to happen. The second job that it has is giving the skin its color. Basically, it shows our melanin or whatever color you're going to be. As I'm very fair, there can be very darker skin colors. So it's all dependent on what your epidermis is making. It also protects our body. It has special cells that are part of our immune system that keeps us healthy, protects us from bacteria and things like that. The most important part specifically for hydradenitis is the making of new cells. And it's also the opening to where the hair follicles exit. Um, and where our pores are. So that's two things to remember as well. It's kind of like an exit point for some of the things that grow out of our skin. So let's talk about the dermis. The dermis is that second layer. Um, it houses sweat glands, hair, and the hair follicles primarily grow from this area. It has muscles, some sensory neurons or like nerves, and it has some blood vessels. The dermis itself is broken up into two different layers. You have the papillary layer, which is the uppermost layer, and it's a little bit thinner and it has uh, loose connective tissue and it connects to the epidermis, that top layer. And then you have the reticular layer, which is the deepest layer. It's thicker. Um, it's less cellular based, but it consists of a lot of like dense connective tissues and bundles of collagen and fibers and things like that. Um, this is where primarily our immune system cells start to come from. So we've got the epidermis that has our exit point of um, to the point of where our follicles can exit and our pores are open to. And then we have the dermis where the hair follicle is actually growing from and also have our immune cells. So let's go into that last layer, which is the subcutaneous tissue. And this is the deepest layer of the skin. It contains the fat tissue primarily, but it does also have some skin appendages as well. So the hair follicles, although they primarily are in the dermis, they can be very, very deep where the bulb or the bottom of the hair follicle itself can actually be right at the junction just between the dermis and the, subcut or, yeah, the, dermis and the subcutaneous layer. 
There are some sensory neurons as well as some blood vessels. So let's get into the nitty gritty. What is HS or what is hydradenitis? Hydradenitis suprativa is a chronic, painful, malodorous disorder, disorder of the hair follicles and primarily in areas that have sweat glands. So chronic, it's continuous, it's constant, it can ebb and flow. Painful, especially as we get into a little bit more, these patients can experience a lot of cysts, a lot of scarring. Malodorous because of the bacteria that can sit there as well and that can collect. Um, and where is it usually? The primarily causes or locations are the axilla or under the arms, the groin, the buttocks, underneath the breasts, and the perineum, which is the space between um, the genitals and the anus. It can happen in other areas as well as the abdomen, the neck, anywhere that have sweat glands, but these are probably the most common areas that we see. Um, so we'll keep on going. So how does it develop? So although the mechanism is not completely understood, it is thought that hydradenitis begins with follicular occlusion. So what does that mean? So the hair follicle gets clogged. Why? Because there's oil, because there's excess skin, because there's sweat, something gets clogged or causes it to clog. Um, as the fo follicular duct, so the pore itself continues to collect skin, it also promotes inflammation because your body is recognizing something that shouldn't be there. We don't want all this excess skin there. We don't want um, that follicle to be closed. We want it to be nice and open. So your body is actually very smart and it starts to recognize that things are there, shouldn't be there. And then if that follicular duct is not opened up, it'll eventually can rupture. And with this rupture, it can lead to the re release of the contents of what's in your pores, basically. So you have dead skin cells, you have hair follicles that might have matured and they're like supposed to be coming out and really they just got stuck. You have oil, you have bacteria. And with this rupturing of the follicular contents, you can actually start to see some sinus tracts develop. And I'll explain what sinus tracts are in a little bit. Um, the other thing that we've been able to figure out and how hydradenitis develops is there's some dysregulation with the immune system. Um, and actually we've noticed hydradenitis can have very similar qualities to Crohn's disease. So who does it happen to, right? So it can affect anywhere from one to 4% of the population is actually affected. And why that number is so varied is because some people are not properly diagnosed um, they can just be seen as they just have one cyst that's constant and actually can be hydradenitis or they just aren't made aware. Some providers, it's, I was just mentioning this before, they, I have patients that come in and I tell them they have hydradenitis and they're like, well, why didn't anyone tell me this before? Cause they've been treated and treated. And I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, so sometimes it's just not said and maybe they're still treating it. I'm not quite sure, I'm not in their position, but it actually happens quite often. Um, symptoms can begin anywhere from puberty to the 40s. It's most commonly onset in 20s to 30s and way less common in puberty. Usually when we see it in puberty, it actually can be more severe of a condition and obviously can be a lot longer term, which is unfortunate for those patients. Um, it affects usually more females than males, go us. And, Usually it affects more African-Americans than any other race or any other ethnicity as well. So what else? What else is composed of it, right? So there's some genetic components that we can have. Um, about 40% of patients usually have a first degree relative with hydradenitis. Um, mechanical forces can can come into play with increased pressure and friction from clothing, actually. It can cause and lead to development of new lesions. So if you think about like a bra strap that wraps around underneath our breasts, it's a super common area that can be affected or belts actually around the abdominal area, underwear that sits kind of in our groin that rubs together. Obesity is part of it as well, although it's not mutually exclusive, which means 
patients are not always overweight, but it's more common to see an overweight patient that has hydradenitis. Um, you can be thin and still have it though. There also has been noted to be correlations between weight and disease severity. So the heavier that patients are, the worse the condition can be because we know that fat tissue actually promotes inflammation. So it's not terribly surprising that that, that can be the case. In terms of smoking, um, patients that smoke actually are at higher risk for worsening of the condition because again, it's pro-inflammatory. So it's leading to more inflammation within the body. Um, with hormones, it's not completely understood, but there is some research out there relating to hormones that they've shown perimenstrual flares to happen or around the period, a lot of people can get more flares. And it's actually been shown some improvement with anti-androgen uh, medications. So things that again, affect our hormones and balance out our hormones have been shown to be helpful. And in terms of drugs, Sometimes IUDs cannot be helpful. Um, if you think about IUDs, they don't always have medication in them. Um, they've been shown to worsen hydradenitis. And in a small study, actually, we've actually seen lithium has made hydradenitis worse for patients as well. Not just with hydradenitis, there are some commonly seen associated conditions that patients can have in addition to hydradenitis. Again, not completely mutually exclusive, just because you have a hydradenitis doesn't necessarily mean you have to have these conditions as well, but they're very commonly seen together. So metabolic syndrome, very basically metabolic syndrome is a combination of five conditions and you have to have at least three. So obesity is one of them, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, elevated sugar levels, and low good cholesterol. So we have good and bad cholesterol. So you have low good cholesterol and high bad cholesterol, which is not a good combination. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you can see liver disease, pulmonary disease, so affects the heart, Crohn's, which affects the GI system. A lot of these patients also have pretty severe acne. Um, again, they don't have to, but it, it can be seen that way. And then depression and anxiety, because if you think about where the condition affects, you're thinking about very personal areas for patients. So it's a lot of stress to even wear a tank top. And it's very depressing because it can be very painful. Um, and as I get into treatments and a little bit further in, we don't we have a lot of treatment options, but they're not very targeted and they're not so great. So we do our best to give patients relief from this, but we don't always win. So what does hydradenitis look like? It can be as basic in terms of the beginning symptoms as redness in an area. Obviously this is not something that we can immediately diagnose and be like, oh, I see redness. You definitely have hydradenitis, but from a very basic perspective, it can start as just basically redness. You have comedones or clogged pores or blackheads is primarily what we see, little clusters of blackheads. You can have inflammatory nodules, which are more of what patients think as like a whitehead. You can have abscesses, you can have scarring, and you can have sinus tracts. So I just wanted to put a picture disclosure slide because hydradenitis is not always a forgiving condition or it's not very kind to the patients that have it. Um, the following photos that I'm gonna show review different phases of hydradenitis. Some photos are more involved than others. So if you're uncomfortable looking at them, please just be aware about the next six slides or so, and I'll make sure I make a comment of it. They contain some images of what hydradenitis looks like. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move forward. So the first picture here, we have comedones or blackheads. And this happens a lot. Um, obviously we see blackheads in terms of acne and things like that. So seeing a lot of blackheads on someone's facial skin is relatively normal. And then I'm sure patients can have random one-off blackheads on their back or their abdomen, like it can happen anywhere because it's just basically dirt that gets into the, um, the follicle or the pore. But when we start to see clustering of them like this, especially in an area where hydradenitis is primarily caused, this definitely raises a, a red flag for us that like, okay, we, we gotta be aware of this and treat it. 
Um, here we have our inflammatory nodules. Obviously, you can see a little bit more involved, a little bit more bacteria here. In this instant, we have two pretty big abscesses here. Patient is probably in a lot of pain, very uncomfortable. This photo we have here on the left is an extreme case of scarring, but it's very classic actually in how the scars look. You can see these divots here and the skin kind of overgrows and overlaps. Um, it's extremely common. The next picture here is also sinus tracts. So this whole red area actually is affected and connecting one between the other with, with bacteria. So in Hurley staging. So this is basically used in the office. It's a tool for providers to categorize disease severity. So how bad is the condition? You've got Hurley stage one, you've got Hurley stage two, and you've got Hurley stage three. I've got three more slides with pictures and then I'm done with pictures. So Hurley stage one is abscess formation. So it can be single, it can be multiple, but it's without sinus tracts and without scarring. So you can see this patient just has a few little abscesses here. This would be considered stage one. You have stage two with recurrent abscesses. So you can see there's a lot more inflammatory tissue or redness that this patient probably doesn't normally have um, from abscesses that could have been treated in the past and then retreated. So um, this is something we notice. The scarring you can see here and here. This patient doesn't have um, sinus tracts, but it can be involved and then there can be multiple lesions. And stage three, so it's completely involving the underarms. It's diffused or almost completely diffuse involvement um, with multiple interconnected sinus tracts, abscesses across the entire area and scarring. So you can see a lot of these abscesses here, a lot of the scarring, inflammation, like it's a combination of a little bit of everything here. All right, we're out of the pictures. So treatment. So the, like I said, there's no cure for hydradenitis, but obviously we have goals for our treatment and they're kind of laid out here basically as follows. So our goal is to try to reduce the formation of new inflammatory lesions. We wanna to try to reduce the sinus tracts if we can and hopefully completely prevent scarring or minimize it as much as possible. Um, we wanna treat existing lesions and reduce any associated symptoms. So like pain or drainage or smell and we want to minimize any associated psychological morbidity. So like I was discussing before, it can really affect the mental psyche, which is something that we have enough things that can affect. So we want to do our, excuse me, we want to do our best to try to limit that as, as good as possible. So treatment, there's a lot of treatments. So I'm going to kind of go through everything and with treatment, especially with this, there's no one size fits all. There's not like, I'm gonna give you one of these and I can guarantee you're gonna be 100% better. You'll never have a breakthrough that just doesn't exist, unfortunately, but we can use a lot of these treatments in combination with one another and really just do our best. What's good in having so many options is we can customize this as best as possible, but usually what's bad about seeing so many options is they're, they don't always work, right? So we've got some topical therapies. You can advise warm compresses if patients have like those small inflammatory nodules or those abscesses that can kind of help um, drainage, the drainage process. Over-the-counter washes like benzoyl peroxide can actually help open up and unclog pores from that superficial very top layer. Um, topical clindamycin is a topical antibiotic that's a prescription, which can be used in conjunction with benzoyl peroxide. So when the pores are unclogged and open, then the topical clindamycin can get in and treat the bacteria. So we're treating that excess skin, that excess gunk that's in there, and as well as fighting off the bacteria. You can do steroid injections when something's very inflamed. This, uh, the steroid can go in there and help break up the inflammation and allow your body the time to properly heal the lesion. They're a little bit uncomfortable, obviously, because most of the time patients are in a little bit of pain already. Um, and a needle injection is not maybe the best thing, but it does help. There's oral options. 
these the oral antibiotics, these are just to name a few. Doxycycline is in the tetracycline class. Clindamycin and rifampin work together. Doxycycline is a little bit more common practice of an oral antibiotic to use. Um, it helps fight the specific bacteria that we usually notice with hydradenitis. Clindamycin and rifampin is not super commonly used because it does come with some side effects and the treatment is a lot longer. So we want to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good, but it is definitely a good option for patients for sure. Anti-androgenetic uh, anti agents. So I mentioned this before to help with some of like the excess hormones that we might notice. So different birth controls can be helpful. A medication called spironolactone, which we use a lot in dermatology to help with um, androgens and metformin. Metformin is not usually prescribed by dermatologists. Probably a lot of you are thinking like, hey, that's what people take for diabetes. And you'd be correct. Um, I did mention some associated conditions though as well and diabetes and obesity is one of them. So there's been some thought that maybe the, the insulin resistance um, plays a role in it, but I, we can't nail that down really for sure. But it has been shown to help in some studies. And isotretinoin. So isotretinoin is actually Accutane. And this can help at a few levels. I did mention that some patients can have acne as well. So that can help clear up the acne. And with isotretinoin, it helps with the oil production and it helps with cell proliferation or skin cell growth. And when you have a lot of oil and a lot of skin cell growth, the skin cells can get stuck to the top layer of the skin. And then that's what leads to more follicular or pore clogging. So if we can keep the follicles open and from being unclogged, this is a good option. Um, incision and drainage is actually where we go in and we numb. Usually this is with abscesses, those bigger ones, we go in and we numb them. And then we evacuate and drain out the contents of bacteria that is there. Usually we could pair this with oral antibiotics because most of the time we can't get everything out. So if we can kind of get the majority of it out and then add the antibiotics, that's really helpful. Um, next is biologic therapy, which is a newer, um, not new, but newer option for us. And it's actually probably a little bit more targeted to the condition. You have Humira and you have Remicade. Um, in some studies, they've shown an increase in something called tumor necrosis factor, which is an inflammatory pathway that we've actually studied a lot for psoriasis, but you've seen it in skin cells for patients that have hydradenitis. And Humira and Remicade both actually focus on that pathway. It's actually very fitting that my um, hydradenitis Humira rep came and visited our office today. And they brought this, I mean, what's really good about in general, hydradenitis has a very good patient education system. So they brought this no BS about HS little fun clip so patients, you can watch this video. It's like a three minute video and you learn about painful bumps and nodules and things like that. So if you Google no BS about HS, you can kind of read a little bit more in terms of hydro hydradenitis and Humira. Humira is an injection, so it affects the cellular level systemically and helps calm down the inflammation from inside out. Remicade is an infusion, so it's a little bit more cumbersome in terms of the therapy. Humira, we've seen some great results with. Surgery, um, usually I've seen this done with plastic surgeons. They'll go in and they'll cut out the sinus tracts and put like a wound back there. Obviously when you remove one sinus tract, it doesn't necessarily keep you from developing another one. So this is a lot to go through. Some patients do perfectly well and that's just their treatment and they're good. Um, but because it affects so many areas in the skin, it's impossible to think that you can cut out your underarm skin and cut out your groin skin and call it a day. Even though I did have a patient, I think it was last week, somebody did that. They cut out the skin underneath her underarms and took a skin graft from her back and then sewed it back on. But actually what it ended up doing was making it a little bit more difficult for her to raise her arm. She had scarring from that too. So there's, there's always a, a cost benefit with it. Lasers in theory are supposed to help kind of maybe shrink the pores so then that way things don't continue to overgrow. Again, not always the best option. And then there are clinical trials. So our office does a lot of research in 
different conditions and we're running a clinical trial for hydradenitis right now for another injectable medication. Um, and it seems promising. I mean, the good thing about this is we're trying to do a lot of research and trying to understand this a little bit better. And when we do that, we can give more focus and more controlled treatment and hopefully give patients more relief because this is, like I said, it's not a super forgiving condition. So let's just do a quick overview. So hydradenitis is a painful chronic disease that has no cure. Um, there are three classifications um, of stages of the disease severity. So you have Hurley stage one, you have Hurley stage two and Hurley stage three, which we use to classify how severe the disease is. And like I said, there's a lot of treatment options that can be used in conjunction with one another, but not all tr treatments work for everyone. And that's why there's so many options, a lot of tried and failed things. And even in, in everything that I went through, there's still a lot of alternative therapies that we can try. So it just goes to show that there's a lot of patients out there that really need our help. So if you or someone you know is suffering from hydradenitis, please don't suffer. Call us. We'll do our best we can to help you. It's not necessarily going to be a short road, but we're here definitely to support you and make sure that we get you through it. So you can call our office. The number is listed below. You can go onto our website and request a, a visit, but we'd be happy to see you and happy to help you with the best that we can. So let's go through some questions. I thought I saw some. Oh, they're written down for me. Great. Okay. So question number one, if an obese patient were to lose weight, would the HS improve? Couldn't guarantee that, but it actually could help a lot. Like I said, um, fat cells are very pro-inflammation. So if we were to lose some weight, it actually reduces some of the, some of the inflammation in the body. If that's the primary thing that's causing this patient to have these cysts or these abscesses, it definitely could help. It could help hopefully reduce the amount of number that you get and hopefully the severity. Um, let's see, you mentioned it being inflammatory. Is a daily anti-inflammatory medication needed? Um, like things like NSAIDs or like Tylenol, ibuprofen, things like that aren't necessarily gonna help because those are way less specific. This is way more skin cell specific, not blood cell specific. So I wouldn't recommend necessarily just taking an ibuprofen every day just to help calm down some inflammation in the body. It's way more specific than just that. Um, as a patient, how do I know I have a sinus tract? What do I feel for? So sinus tracts actually feel like a firm band. So if you like stretch a rubber band, I don't know if I have one on my desk. Let me see. Aha, uh -huh, I do. So if you stretch a rubber band and you almost kind of feel how firm it is when it's at like tension, you can almost feel what a sinus tract would feel like. Your skin should be soft and movable. Obviously it's not gonna give so much because it's protecting us, but something that feels super like firm. And when you push on it, if you see drainage coming out of one end or the other, because a sinus tract is a connection from point A to point B that shouldn't be there you can see drainage come from both sides as well. So it feels firm. It feels like a band, basically. And there's drainage. So I don't know if that helps. Um, is there a way to treat the scarring from HS? It's, it's challenging, to be honest. Once Scarring in general, it's not even just HS, but scarring in general is very difficult to treat. Even acne scars are difficult to treat. But in the pictures that I showed you, you can see how deep and invasive and involved they can be most of the time. I mean, there's some lasers that can maybe help resurface. If you're really looking to get rid of them, surgery is probably your best option, but I wouldn't recommend that until the condition is under control. Because if you're gonna go in and you're gonna go through that, um, you want to make sure that you're not going to break out and then just kind of lead to this vicious cycle. What treatment works better to prevent scarring? It really depends on how severe the condition is. Um, obviously, the more aggressive we can be, the better, but some patients respond very well to just topical benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin, and they're stable with that. Um, 
So usually that's where we start, depending on how bad it is, like early stage one, that's where we can start. And then as we progress and like, if things continue to get worse, we can add oral antibiotics. But if someone has a lot of area involvements, like some people can just have the underarms that are involved and not every area that I mentioned. But if patients have a lot of areas involved, it's usually when we start to consider like a systemic medication, something like a Humira, um, to try to calm down the inflammation immediately. So then that way you're not leading yourself to more scarring. Let's see, are biologic ther therapies safe? They are, I mean, obviously with anything that we put into our bodies, there's some risk benefit, right? We're always taking a little bit of a risk when we um, use any type of oral medication. Um, obviously we would ask you the proper screening questions to make sure that you wouldn't be at risk because most patients with hydradenitis have an overactive immune system. What bi biologics do is they help calm down the, the overactive immune system. They don't always bring it back down to perfectly normal. They might drop it a little bit, but you're not thinking about taking something like a chemotherapeutic agent. That's not what we're giving you. Um, are you maybe at risk for a cold a little bit more frequently? Yep, that's definitely a possibility. We usually do blood work and we check for like tuberculosis just to make sure that you're not experiencing or, or developing that once a year. Um, but they're actually very safe. We've had them around for a long time. And then what's the process? How do you get involved in a clinical trial? So you can come in and make an appointment with one of the providers and we can hook you up with one of our clinical trial coordinators. They're fantastic, our whole department. Um, or you can actually just call Jenna, who is our clinical trial um, liaison. She's fantastic. So if you call our office, you can ask for Jenna, or even you can dial her direct extension is, here she is, 1416. So Jenna, if you leave her a message, you give her the proper details, so your first and last name, you give her your date of birth what you're interested in, because we do have other trials than just hydradenitis. Um, she'll give you a call back and, and be able to direct you a little bit more towards when we can get you in, explain the clinical trial process, um, things like that. Let's see. And what's nice about clinical trials though, as well as if patients don't have insurance, like this is definitely a, a condition we wanna treat. You don't have to pay for medicine. So, that is like what I, what I love about our office is that we can really help patients that really need it, which is amazing. Um, let's see. And then the last question I see, any treatment in the pipeline? So that's why we do clinical trials. Um, there's a medication that's, that's pending that, we're, that we see that can be very um, promising. We've seen great results so far in the patients that we have in the trial. I'm not exactly sure when it's gonna be approved in terms for a, for hydradenitis, um, but it actually is being approved for psoriasis very shortly. So hopefully it'll follow, it'll follow suit. Perfect. All right, well, that is all the questions I see. So the last thing I will leave you with is um, Dr. Simone is doing a hair loss consult day on August 26th. So you can consult her about any types of hair loss and she'd be happy to discuss what type of hair loss you have and any treatment options that are available. So if you're interested, spots are filling up quick. So please make sure that you give us a call and we'd be happy to get you in. As well as if you are suffering from hydradenitis and you need some help, give us a call. We're happy to help you. All right, thank you so much for listening. I hope I didn't drone on too much in Borea and I hope this was a little bit educational. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel. If you wanna watch and like hear about some of the different treatment options, please feel free. Um, and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you, everyone.